Hello, time for tea for teachers. I'm taking a little time out uh, to answer your questions. My name's Steve Watts. I'm from Watts English. I've been teaching kids for around 15 years. Uh, that's a long lesson, 15 years. I'm only joking. Okay, uh, let's take a little look at a question that we've got. Thank you for all of your questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can. Um, if I don't answer, then perhaps you can resubmit your question. Um, better luck next time. I'll see what I can do. Uh, okay, question here. I think it's come through on Instagram. Thank you for following us on Instagram. I post a few stories up there, and uh, I hope you like our content. Okay, we have a question from uh, Learn English in Russia Kids. Hi, hello to all of the kids in Russia that are learning English. Well, hello to all of them. Doesn't matter if you're learning English or not. Uh, you said, um, I can ask anything, anything you've put. Well, how does a mum obtain that play and learn teaching mode, especially if she's far from being natural and can speak English all right, but wants her kids to speak English too, but playing all the time is such a hard job. We want to just be ourselves at home. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, I think the most important thing is definitely to be yourself at home. Children very, very quickly know if you are being yourself or not. Um, they can really see through that. And if you're forcing yourself to be something you're not, then they can pick up on the fact that something is different, something is unnatural, something is a little bit wrong. It's a very big topic about um, parents as teachers. I think it's important for us to remember there's a significant difference between being a teacher and being a parent. Uh, I've got uh, two kids, so I'm a parent as well. And um, I see that uh, the parent's role, or, or, or you know, what usually typically happens with a parent, is that we're trying to remove obstacles for the children. We're trying to take them away and help them overcome. Uh, the obstacle. So if there's a particular problem, perhaps I step in, I sort it out, and I let the kids get on with it. Uh, as a teacher, of course, what we're trying to do is we're putting obstacles in the way and helping the children to think how to get around that obstacle or how to overcome that obstacle. We help them a little bit, but we don't remove the obstacle. So in terms of um, teaching um, English and having two languages, I think it's important for you to separate um, you as the mum and you as the uh, as the the native English speaker or the English teacher in this instance. Uh, I think having a puppet is fantastic for that, and it will also perhaps give the children a, a character to hook the language onto as you are changing language. I think we need to be important about how we change uh, the language, how we switch from one language to the other. My experience of um, learning French was that uh, I was quite good at speaking French. My parents were very proud that I could speak French. So they took every opportunity just to sort of say, oh, Steve's very good at, at French. Steve, come here and, and speak French. And of course, that's quite a shock. It's quite stressful. And it's a situation that just came out of the blue. So bringing out a, a puppet, um, can have the same effect as a, a bilingual parent, a, a parent that speaks one language and a different parent that speaks another language, in that the children can hook the, uh, the language around that particular character. It could be that uh, you practice English at the same time, in the same place. Um, all of these sort of things are, are what the children can hook the language onto. And I think what you can do uh, is with the puppet is you can get them, uh, you say this puppet only speaks English, you can get them to start to play with the puppet, you can play together to get them involved, get them interested, show that you are interested, you are in it, involved with it. But of course, as you've said, you know, it is such a hard job. Once they're playing and uh, you can step out of the play and leave them to, uh, to, to play. If they stay in English with the, with the puppet, that's fantastic, that's what we want. If they then switch languages, well, what I do with Maggie is I say, well, Maggie's a little bit sad now because she doesn't understand uh, what's happening. So I think she'll, she'll fly away and she'll have a little sleep and you can carry on playing with your other toys. I hope that helps. Um, of course, yes, um, you know, to give more energy, more time is wonderful, but let's be realistic. And of course, if you're tired and stressed, the children pick up on that, and then those negative uh, feelings get attached to the language, and you'll be digging yourself into a bit of a hole. Those are my thoughts and feelings on uh, the parent as a teacher. Thank you for watching Tea for Teachers. 
Please leave your comments. Uh, if you agree, disagree, or have another question, put them in the comments section below. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you have time for a cup of tea with the teachers. Thanks. Bye. Hello. This is not Tea for Teachers. Well, no, this is Tea for Teachers, but this is not tea. It's coffee. Mmm. Anyway, hi. Thanks for coming back. Uh, this is where we answer some uh, questions about teaching. My name's Steve Watts. I've been teaching children for around 15 years. So we have a question here. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. It's from uh, Ranashobaki. I hope I'm even close. Um, you sent us a message on Instagram where I post some things about what's happening, what's going on in, in, uh, in my life. Your question here is that your three-year-old daughter can count very well, she can read well, and she knows the alphabet. Um, but she doesn't really want to hold a pencil or draw, and you can tell that she doesn't like it. I think the key thing there is, uh, yeah, to like it. Um, if she enjoys doing something, she'll want to do it again and again. Sometimes when we start writing, we put a little bit too much pressure on getting things right from the very start. Don't forget, it's a really important stage, the scribble stage. Just picking something up, making a mark on a piece of paper, having fun, just drawing anything, just making those scribbles, doing lots of different colours is a key stage. I also um, was in a very privileged position to talk to um, Mactarius. Uh, he was the, I think, the vice president of OMAP, um, the world um, organization to do with child development um, for the years zero to eight. And he's quite a specialist on um, helping children to write. Now, what he did, he showed me a video that he had of the very small children writing, pretending to be a doctor. They weren't really writing, but they were holding a pen, they were listening to, they were role-playing being a doctor, um, they were listening to the patient, the patient was saying what's wrong with them, and they were just making marks on a piece of paper, pretending to write, and they really enjoyed it. They enjoyed the experience of holding the pen and pretending to write something. They were also pretending to write a list of something. We forget, of course, that so much about learning is actually just copying. So when they can copy you, where they don't have to get all the letters correctly, it's not about handwriting, it's not about correct spelling, it's just simply about making a mark on a piece of paper with a pen. Those were fun ways to get the children to hold a pen and to start writing in that context. I hope that goes some way to answering your questions. Um, if you have any other questions about uh, starting to read and write, or indeed if you have some of your thoughts, please do put them in the comments section below and we'll try to address them. Thank you so much for watching Tea and Coffee for Teachers. Cheers. Hello, hi, my name's Steve. Uh, I'm an English teacher. I've been teaching small children for around 15 years and this is Tea for Teachers with a completely different tea, coffee, from last time we recorded. That's important to remember. Okay, let's get on with the questions. So here we go. Uh, we have something from Ingrid Richardson down in Chile. Wow, that's a long way away from where I am. Oh, I'd love to go to Chile. It seems a very, very interesting and for me, exotic country. Uh, you wrote uh, a comment to our uh, What's English Facebook page. We had a video of um, a teacher doing some drilling. You said it looks perfect. Thank you, that's great. We always try to make drilling a fun and important part of the lesson. It is a key stage. Um, when you think you've done too much drilling, do a little bit more because you probably haven't done enough. Um, the kids need it. Um, you have put here though, uh, but you have a class of 35 children. Any ideas of how to work with that amount of students? Yeah, uh, when you do have big classes, I always say try to divide the class up, especially lots and lots of uh, team work. If you're sitting in rows, obviously, you know, each row can become a team. But the important thing about teamwork is to always change it. So you don't get stuck into a rut of week after week having the same team. The rivalry that builds up there starts to become very difficult to manage. 
Um, but what I would do uh, for that one particular lesson is um, take you know, five or six children per team. You can have uh, each team drilling uh, one particular word and they can repeat it in many different ways. Then they need to be quiet as you move on to the next one because they're still listening. They're listening to their, um, their fellow students. So they're still in that English environment but I would break it up a little bit like that. You can also maybe take uh, one person from each team, uh, bring them together and drill in that way. So it's all about sort of dividing up the class in many, many different ways so that you can do the drilling. But drilling certainly works for large groups as well. You have to be a little bit careful of the, uh, the really loud drills, but in terms of the quiet drills, uh, the whisper drills, uh, the, the low drills, the triple drills, the character drills, all of those work absolutely fine in large classes. Thank you so much uh, for your uh, question. I hope I've gone some way to answering it. If you have a different idea or a different approach, please let us know about it in the comments section below. If you have your own question, start a new thread with your question there. Thank you so much for watching Tea for Teachers. Uh, enjoy teaching. <laughs> See you soon. Ta-ra. Mm, it's gone cold. And it's the same cup. No, different. Um, I don't know. Hello, hi, I'm Steve. Uh, this is Tea for Teachers from What's English. I've been teaching kids for 15 years, uh, having great fun, and I hope you are too. But of course, we all need a bit of time out and a cup of tea. Mm. Let's take a look at some questions. Okay, uh, we had a message here from Merlin Rose. Hello to you, uh, Merlin. Um, right, you said, hey Steve, what about grammar? Do you have any videos for my school kids? Um, well, yes, uh, is the answer to that. I think it's in all of the videos that we do. Um, grammar is, of course, an integral part of the language, and we can't say anything without uh, using the grammar. And in the videos that uh, we've posted up uh, on YouTube, on Wow English TV, we made a point of not oversimplifying the language, not dumbing the language down. And if we need to use a certain phrase or a certain tense in that situation, then we use it. Um, for instance, maybe fashion show. It's a fashion show. Uh, that has the question, what are you wearing? Which is, of course, the present continuous tense. If you're asking me, Merlin, in terms of uh, do we really break that down academically um, to show the parts of speech, um, the answer is no. Um, what we want the children to initially uh, come to is to have a, a sense of fun of the language and a feel for the language. So they intrinsically start to understand and have a, um, an insight into how the grammar should actually be uh, put together. My example of this is, uh, as I was teaching in a kindergarten class, uh, there was a little boy who was always very quiet, didn't speak at all. Uh, and it got to the point that I was starting to get a little worried and thinking, okay, are there deeper learning issues that I might need to address or to, to bring somebody in to address? But I always included them in the lesson and was always asking questions. And one day we were playing hide and seek. Um, we had a little time and we were out in the garden and I said, okay, uh, where is this other girl? And uh, he stopped and he sort of thought and he said, uh, oh, uh, Steve, she is behind the tree. And he came up with the full sentence. It wasn't just uh, she tree or she behind tree, it's she is behind the tree. And I think from that we can see that if I had focused just on the vocabulary, then he would have the vocab, but because the structure was always there, the grammar was always there, he had a feel, had an understanding that there needs to be more things around this vocabulary for this sentence to, uh, to, to make sense. This is great for the smaller kids, uh, the kind of, you know, the, the kindergarten children, maybe up to about the age of sort of like um, five, six, seven. Of course, later on for the older children, we do need to focus them on the grammar. But I think that's a lot easier to do once they've developed the feel for the language and they know that the sentence should sound like this.
That's when we can put it up on the board and, can, and we can say, well, what you've been saying, what you've been using is the language in this um, formula, in, in this sort of like academic presentation of it. Something they need to know later. But uh, what we focus on is certainly a more communicative approach to get, give them the feel for the language. And then we can take a look at the academic structure a little later on. As always, uh, those are my thoughts and feelings on the subject. If you have a different opinion, please let us know. Put it into the comments section below. If you have a new question uh, that you'd like us to address, uh, then start a new thread with a new comment in this section also below. Thank you very much for watching. Enjoy your time out with your tea and have fun teaching. Cheers. Mm. Oh, you're here already. Fantastic. Welcome to Tea for Teachers with me, Steve Watts. I've been teaching uh, small children for about 15 years, uh, teaching English as a second or a foreign language. Hope you've got your cup of tea ready. Uh, it's the time that we can spend together to discuss your questions. Uh, we had a live stream uh, that was a few days ago now. It was very successful. A lot of you said thank you and thank you for saying thank you. And we hope to do some more coming up soon. Um, we have a question from Blessing Chris on Facebook. Thanks for following us and uh, thanks for your question. You say, how do I teach my three-year-old boy three languages at once? Of course, he's already learning English fast from your videos. Thank you very much. Our video is on WOW English TV on YouTube. Uh, that's great that he enjoys them and is learning English. Uh, but he needs to learn German. Uh, that's where we live. And our mother, mother language from Africa. Okay, so that's uh, trilingual. Um, my advice here would be the fact that, okay, if he's learning English with our videos, that's great. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of other um, things that he can watch um, to be exposed to English. Um, I would suggest that uh, living in Germany when, uh, okay, three years old, so maybe starting to go to kindergarten sometime soon, I think there's gonna be no problem with him picking up German, um, playing with the uh, children. He'll soon have friends um, and he'll be, uh, he'll be uh, immersed in that language and I certainly wouldn't worry about him picking up uh, that language. Um, I think uh, that would be absolutely fine. And your mother tongue from Africa? I think it's uh, mother tongue. Um, so I would recommend using um, that language in the, in the house. Uh, and of course when he's at home then he'll be immersed in uh, that language. When he's at kindergarten he'll be immersed uh, in German and through hopefully watching uh, some of our videos and our content and perhaps um, some, uh, some more sort of focused classes using maybe hopefully some of our books, uh, the, WOW, <laughs> the WOW series, um, then I think that that's, uh, that's the way to go. And of course it is certainly possible for children to be trilingual. Uh, so there you go. Thanks very much. Um, if you've got any comments uh, on that, please put them in the comments section below. If you have a new question, please just uh, post something up on our wall. We'll pick it out and hopefully we'll answer your question. Thanks for watching. Tea for teachers. Cheers.